the book of Joshua, chapter 14. I want us to start from verse 6. The book of Joshua, chapter 14, from verse 6. And we'll go all the way to verse 15. Amen. And we can read together. I'm reading from ESV. The Bible says, Then the people of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kesenite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God in Kadesh Barnea, concerning you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent, uh, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him uh, word again as it was in my heart. But my brothers who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. Yet I wholly followed the Lord my God. Verse 9, and Moses saw on that day, saying, Surely the land on, who, on which your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance for you, you and your children forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, just as he said, these 45 years since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel was walking in the, uh, walked in the wilderness. And now behold, I am this day 85 years old. I am still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me. My strength now is as my strength was then, for war and for going and coming. So now, give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. For, uh, for, you, uh, for you heard on that day how the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord uh, will be with me and I shall drive them out just as the Lord said. Then Joshua blessed him. And he gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, for an inheritance. Verse 14 and 15. Therefore, Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, the name of Hebron formerly was Kiriath Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim, and the land had rest from war. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you this wonderful morning with thanksgiving, with praises on our lips, O God. We can look back and say that you have been Ebenezer this far. You have walked with us, O God. And our desire this morning as we congregate in this place is that you shall speak to us, O God. That you shall amplify your word in the name of Jesus. That that word shall come with power, with grace, and with anointing. Father, there, are, there is darkness, O God, in some places of our lives. I pray that, Father God, that word shall light up the dark places for deliverance for transformation, from translation, even to the next level in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray to my hearers, that Father, for my hearers, that you shall prepare their heart and Father, their ear, in the name of Jesus Christ, that this word shall bring forth fruit, a hundredfold in the name of Jesus Christ. And for me, Lord, as a vessel, that I shall be that vessel that, Father, you have honored to use this morning. I pray, God, that you shall take dominion, take charge, take preeminence. Those that are listening from far and wide, and even after this service, oh God, I pray that they too shall be blessed, and Master, you shall visit them. We thank you, we bless you, in Jesus' name we pray. You can invite your friend and tell them be ready to be blessed. Amen. So before I go into the word, I want to uh, bring us uh, greetings uh, from our Geo. Geo is uh, down there in uh, Maledi as he informed us last, uh, last Sunday, I had ministry with the Reverend Greg in Yahuru and in Malindi, and now he is in Maledi. And uh, you know, a great work is hap has happened there, and I know that uh, in the launch and in the dedication of the, of the facility that you helped and contributed towards, I believe that God is going to be coming down in that place. We have had our mission team. Uh, together with many others from our GCI churches, uh, they have been down there. And those that are in our platforms, you know, I know you have seen a few of the clips of the great work that is happening there. People are hearing the gospel. And that's the beauty when we have these sheepfolds happening there. Therefore, I want to encourage you, make sure that, uh, you know, you are, cont you, are, you are redeeming your pledges so that God may be able to uh, do the work that he desires to do in these last days. Amen. Our resident pastor, as you know, she also went out of the country, and she's fine. She's sending her regards. And I take this uh, morning, uh, this moment to say thank you to Gio for giving us this opportunity. 
Now, I have a word, and I have titled this word, Conquest Mentality. Conquest? Now, you know we have been running for the last two years with a theme, Advancing for Conquest. And I know uh, we also have had a series, uh, which is actually just still marrying on this, uh, for the last few days of, uh, you know, uh, what does it say? Favor that brings what? Good? Has it been powerful? I think this year, God just decided to bless us. We had a great uh, June conference. We had a great uh, ladies' conference. And the men actually you know, take, uh, took the theme of the ladies' conference and continued with it. But now the movers are here. Hallelujah. And they say, I move. I move. <laughs> Hallelujah. And uh, it could not have been better. Reverend Greg Johnson came and capped uh, the men's month with a powerful message. So... Uh, let's go in straight into the message. So this year, uh, we are in that topic of uh, advancing for conquest. It's based on uh, Joshua chapter 1 and verse 2. And I'd like to say, maybe we are now in a comfortable place where we, have, we can say that uh, our members or those that have interacted with us have they either, either conquered or are conquering or are just about to conquer. Hallelujah. But now, how do we sustain this conquest that we have entered to, we require to have a, a conquest mentality. For us to sustain what God began and what he has been doing, we need to have a conquest mentality. Now, in the first service, and also in this, this service, I, I, I want to quote a man that said, there's actually nothing, that, uh, there's nothing called absolute success. And uh, you may agree with me after I explain. There's nothing that you call absolute success. Uh, only what you have is levels of success. And I'll explain. Uh, when you start school and you are in the primary school, we send one another success cards, don't we? And when you send success cards, you know, you succeed in that. But you stop there. You go to Form 4. Do we also send success cards? And we send success cards in Form 4. When you go to college, we also su send success cards. But does it end there? No, even when you go to the university, we still send success cards or wishes or WhatsApp and we issue success. Does it mean that you have finished it all? If you leave, you know, after succeeding in kindergarten, in PP2, and you leave it there, what shall we say? We, have say? we shall say that you have failed. But don't we celebrate the children that have finished PP2? I was here on Wednesday. We had... Uh, we were graduating some kids from uh, PP2, and we had a fantastic time with the King's Kid uh, uh, you know, Academy as we, as we were celebrating those children. But success is only in levels. You have it in PP2. You have it in class 8, now maybe grade 6. You have it in, uh, in grade 9, uh, from 4, when I specifically. way. There can only be levels of, succeed, uh, of success. Hallelujah. And it is important to know that when you conquer one mountain, there is also another one that you ought to conquer. The conquest mentality. Hallelujah. Amen. So, it is important, however, to appreciate where we have reached. Because if you do not appreciate where you are, then even that begins to depreciate. I think that we have been told many times. What you do not appreciate does what? It depreciates. If you don't appreciate your shoe by mafuta or polishing it, what happens? It begins to depreciate. But when you, uh, when you appreciate your clothes by taking it to the laundry, it looks as good as new. It is good to, to, you know, to know that God has done some few things for us where we are. Now, the story that we have read is of a man called Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. This was a man of the tribe of Judah. Caleb came from the tribe of Judah. In this account, he is 85 years old. His compatriot or his companion or his uh, friend, Joshua, according to 1 Chronicles 7, 20, 27, was a descendant of the tribe, tribe of Ephraim, and, uh, uh, which was uh, a brother to Manasseh. And uh, this is now the person heading the troops or the kingdom of Israel. Remember, Moses has died. And somebody has been given the reins, or he is now the one in charge. So Joshua, the compatriot of Caleb, is now taking charge of the people of Israel. In this story that we have read, Israel has already crossed the Jordan. 
they have crossed over. They are not in the eastern side. They have crossed over. So all the hurdles, the Red Sea, and the, uh, they are now in uh, the Red Sea into the desert. Now the Red Sea, after the Jordan, now they are into the land. Caleb goes to his longtime friend, and they are probably age mates. The only two people, old people that are remaining for the kingdom of Israel. And uh, this is the man they had worked together and worked together and did many exploits. So he approaches him, and he reminds him of the promise from Moses which we can find in Joshua chapter 14 and verses 9, of how Moses swore to give him the land that he set foot upon. Hallelujah. Amen. That is the story of Joshua chapter 14 from verse 6 all the way down. He is there. They are in that, that place. And he's reminding him, remember, there was a word spoken by Moses. Now, for us to understand this, let's set a certain background. So, Israel, after staying in Egypt for hundreds of years, actually 430 years, have been extracted from there by God. And uh, after defeating Pharaoh by very mighty works, you know, after defeating Pharaoh by very mighty works, God extracts them, he passes them through the Red Sea, and now they are in the, des in the desert. Now, in the desert, uh, in the desert, the country of promise is not very far. Remember, this is a promise that was there for Abraham. It was also there for Isaac and Jacob. It, is, uh, it has been written. It has been spoken to Moses. It has been spoken to the Israelites. They are now there. They can see the land. Actually, in the same place, uh, Moses was given an opportunity to go to one of the hills around there and look at it. They can begin to appreciate where they are going into. They can now begin to see this is what God spoke to our forefathers, not exactly 400 years ago, maybe 500, because Abraham had lived far beyond that. Now, this place, the scholars say it is called Kadesh, uh, but there is a Kadesh and Kadesh Banea, but that is about the study. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verses uh, 22, the Bible says, Then all of you came near me. This is Moses speaking. Then all of you came near me and said, Let us send men before us that we may explore the land for us and bring us word again of the way by which we must go up and the cities into which we shall come. Then the thing seemed to go to me, and I took 12 men from you, one man from each tribe. Now, the scriptures that you have read indicate something. These people, when they were in Egypt, God did not show them where and how they would pass to go to the desert and to Canaan land. But God, in his grace and mercy, did miracles in that land. And on account of the miracles that God did, that was confidence enough that whatever else comes on the way, this God that dealt with Pharaoh, this God that dealt with the Egyptians, this God that took us up almost like on wings, he is able to do it even in the future. But now something interesting happens here. And I've said they did not have confidence enough in to, go, in to go into the land that God had promised them. And what do they do? They come to Moses and tell him, Moses, as wise people, as people who are educated and have a few degrees in us, you don't just do things. You can't tell us to go into the land and, uh, you know, tell us to go into the land. And we actually don't know who stays there and how they are. That's why this scripture, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 22 and 23 is there. She so said, you came near me and you told me, let's send some spies there. And that seemed good for me. I know we had nothing to lose. And therefore, I sent you out. I remember when we were talking about these things uh, uh, by our Geo. You know, Geo uh, told us this was not the idea of God. When I was a the way I know you, if God told you what is coming two weeks from now, a month from now, a year from now, now watch this salvation, Lord, stay with this. Uh, let me be first of all past this thing that is coming. And then we God did not, while they were in Egypt, tell them or how difficult it would be to be extracted. And he also did not tell them that even when Pharaoh agrees, praise the Lord, 
Even when Pharaoh agrees, there shall be a thing called the Red Sea. Yes? And there is also going to be, you know, a desert. One called of Zin and Sin. When I asked if you were. There was to be Kadesh Barnea. There was to be lack of water. There was, you know, there were many things. He did not tell them, but he led them. Just because of their faith, he walked with them. Hallelujah. Now, as the story is, the 12 men going to Canaan, uh, he has accepted Moses and he has sent uh, this man. He goes into Canaan and explore and spy the land for 40 days. They did that for 40 days. They completed their expedition and come back with fruit of the land, including grapes and pomegranates from the valley called Esco. Esco, uh, Esco means a cluster of grapes. Uh, they are the ones that named it that way because that's where they got the grapes from. Th this in is indicative or talks about the beauty, you know, and how good that land is. They came with those grapes. The team, however, after coming, discourages the whole congregation of Israel because 10 of them, after seeing the mighty inhabitants, lost hope and by extension influenced everyone else with a negative report. Now, why it was risky to send these people inside is also the risk that we get. I know a few of you have prayed and you have asked God to reveal to you what is going to happen in the next one year. I want to answer that prayer on behalf of God and I want to tell you God is not going to answer. And it is not healthy for him to answer that prayer. Praise the Lord. Because if he tells you, you shall lose hope before you start. Twelve men go in. Among them is Joshua and Caleb. And when they come back, the ten talk about giants they have found. Men tall. You know, two and a half times their size. And they say correctly that we saw ourselves as grasshoppers. Praise the Lord. You know, even for us, there are a few things that God desires you to do or to accomplish. But it matters who surrounds your life. Hallelujah. It matters the friends that you keep. Because friends can help you achieve, but friends can also help you very well to lose what God has in store for you. And this is what happened into Israel. Just in sending the 12, 10 of them came with a negative report. But let me tell you, it is even worse. After they came with a negative report, there was judgment passed, not to the 12, to the whole congregation of Israel. And that's why you must hold your faith. Whether there are people prophesying on the TV and others prophesying on YouTube, whether things are happening left, right, and center, you must hold to your... I was thinking about it. Why did God have to condemn? It is only 12 men that went to spy. He could have struck them dead. But you know, the congregation also chose to believe what they said. But they also had seen. Had they not seen the, you know, the power and the, great, uh, and the grace that God had given them in Egypt, they also had seen it. And for that reason, just by seeing that, they were not supposed to succumb. Therefore, uh, therefore God proclaimed, uh, I've said in my notes, they knew as God was faithful, this is uh, Caleb and Joshua, they knew as God was faithful to deliver them from Pharaoh, he would give them victory in the promise, uh, promised land. But there was now unbelief. And this unbelief caused God to declare that all who were 20 years and above would, not, would die in the wilderness and only those younger or born later would inherit the land. Unbelief brought death. The greatest enemy of this walk is unbelief. Praise the Lord. By the way, when we, when, when we choose not to trust God or we choose to doubt God, Actually, we bring death to ourselves. God cannot work and walk with somebody who has no faith and trust in him. Numbers 14, verses 22. The Bible says, None of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and yet have put me to the test ten times and have not obeyed my voice, shall see the land that I swore to give to their fathers, and none of those who despise me shall see it. So, the verdict was not about the spying. The verdict was about unbelief. Hallelujah. It is very bad for you not to believe. You know what God spoke to you? 
many, many years ago, maybe 10 years ago, maybe 20, maybe 30, maybe 2 years, 5 months ago, God spoke something. I want to tell you that God is going to bring to accomplishment. Praise the Lord. God is not slow in his word. He shall watch over it to perform it in your life. Praise the Lord. For these people, they had seen the works of God. They had seen the manifestation, the graces of God. They did not only have a promise, they also saw the works of God. Have you seen God do something? He healed you. He delivered you. He did something that is extraordinary. I think it is a bad place for you not to continue believing. And verse 24 of Numbers 14 says, But my servant Caleb, because he, had a, he has a different spirit, and has followed me fully, I'll bring into the land into which he went, and his descendants shall possess it. Tell your friend, a different spirit. Hallelujah. Conquest mentality. Tell the other friend, conquest mentality. Hallelujah. Now, with this background, let's now go back to our story. The Israelites are now in the wilderness. And this is, you know, about 38 years after all the people had died, that is the people that were 20 years and above. And uh, God instructed Moses in Deuteronomy 2 and 3 to destroy Sihon, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan. And as we have been told many times here, when they went to war with Og, king of Bashan, and Sihon, king of Heshbon, these were the mightiest kings they would ever encounter. They were in the east of Jordan. This is the land that now Reuben and Dan claim immediately after that. When they went, uh, when they went to, war, uh, to these people, they had no experience. But God wanted to teach them that they can achieve anything as long as they were trusting in God. And it so happens to us that once in a while, God passes us through the fires. He passes us. In, uh, you know, or, or he, help, he allows us to be thrown into the den of lions. A place you know, of turmoil, a place where there is tablets, there are things happening to us. By the way, God is just but preparing you to go into your promised land. As we are speaking now, I know there could be somebody saying, Pastor, you do not know. I am now in the thick of things. Tomorrow, there is a panel raised up for you. In this week, you have to answer a few questions or write memos concerning one or two things. Or just in your life, maybe a doctor issue there and a, and a family issue. I want to tell you, I can tell you, uh, you know, very freely that God is preparing you for great works. For Israel... You know, encountering Sihon, king of Heshbon, and all king of Bashan was a preparation of them to inherit the land that God had designated for them. There was a land that was awaiting for them, but they had to be shown how to fight. Defeating this, uh, these kings was to build up confidence for them so that they may be able to enter into the land. Hallelujah. Now, like all other tribes... Like all other tribes. And before we go there, please remember that uh, there were 12 tribes of Israel. And two and a half have been given land in the east of Jordan. This we talk about every so often. Reuben, Dan, and half tribe of Manasseh. On the other side, where it is called Canaan, nine and a half tribes are going to inherit. Now, like all the other tribes, the tribe of Caleb, that is the tribe of Judah was also allocated its inheritance. Then God commanded Joshua to allocate Caleb from his tribe's inheritance, his rightful portion. This is important. Caleb, as a son of Judah, you know, was, he, he required, or he, it was necessary for him to receive land just as his brethren, just as the other people. Of course, he had an extra uh, promise which we shall be looking at. Joshua chapter 15 and verses 13. He says, according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, he gave to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, a portion among the people of Judah. In other words, his normal portion, his inheritance that was spoken of uh, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even to his forefathers, he gave him a portion. And this was in a place called Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron. And Arba was the father of Anak. Verse 14 says, And Caleb drove out from there the three sons of Anak, Sheshai 
and Ahimai, Ahiman and Talmai, the, the descendants of Anak. Now, faithful brethren, I said that in the first service, I will repeat it again. Faithful brethren always get double portion. Hallelujah. I would like you to lift up your two fingers to your brother and your sister. Amen. Praise Jesus. It is not enough to get born again. But I'm going to clap for you for getting born again. Amen. <laughs> but it is not enough for you to get. There is much to get from the kingdom. And let me tell you, if you advance a little bit and become faithful, there is always a double portion. Hallelujah. Even Elisha of the Bible got a double portion. He desired. By the way, Elisha gets a double portion when there are prophets in the school, in the college. Him, he was not part of that college. I don't think he was even a day scholar. He comes from the farm and meets Elijah. You know, Elijah is going up and he says, and he refuses to let Elijah go. And he says, if you see me go then, you shall have what? Faithful brethren, get what? A double portion. And let me tell you, my breath, brothers, me, I'm pursuing. Billy. Praise Jesus. Do not just be born again. Have something to do in the house of God. It's not just sweeping. And sweeping is good. So you can sweep the house of God, but there is beyond sweeping. You can sweep, you can even mop. If sweeping is not there, you can do what? Hallelujah. And if no, mopping is not there, you can be there as an usher. Hallelujah. <laughs> this rightful portion was, however, not enough for Caleb. He remembered the promise of God and the vow of Moses. This is where he now approaches Joshua and tells him of the land he treaded upon. Caleb had a conquest, a conquest mentality. He was not satisfied with the number. He has already been allocated some land called Kiriath Arba. And, uh, you know, there are giants there. It was one of the best places to be. But he is not satisfied with that. He remembers there was a word. You know, when we were in fellowship in college, when we were at school, when we were in our CU, when I was in Acacia, when I was uh, uh, in a crusade, somebody spoke a word. And this is what we say, they said. It has not happened. And I'm very old now. I want to tell you, our God is coming. Amen. Hallelujah. Caleb had a conquest mentality. He was not satisfied with the normal. He knew God could grant more to those that are faithful and chose to trust him wholeheartedly. While everybody received what was rightfully theirs, Caleb got something extra as a reward for trusting in the faithfulness of God. Conquest mentality trains us to identify opportunities for more. Hallelujah. I was giving an example uh, about our very own general overseer. Now, General Overseer, by all standards, by all standards, this is a good church. Isn't it a beautiful church? Haven't you enjoyed the, the worship? Even the choir presenting? Even the order of service? Why would you think of something else? But today he's not with us. Where is he? He is in Malendi. A church that is smaller than this. Yet, he has even told us here many times that he desires, if you could help him to go out, he desires to go to Malendi. And by the way, he's not ending in Malendi. Next week, he's going to Kakamega. Hallelujah. To set up. And when he finishes there, or when he even begins there, he is not going to stop there. Praise the Lord. There are mountains to get. We must have a conquest mentality. Do not be satisfied by where you are. I started by saying there can only be levels of success. So there is the level of GCI Central. That is a success. But there is also the levels of the counties. Hallelujah. Even for you, there is that that you have right now. And I want to tell you, God can take you to the next level. Now, Matthew chapter 16 and verses 18. This is Jesus speaking to Peter, uh, the chief apostle. And uh, he tells him something profound. After asking him, you know, who do people say I am? And then uh, the Kimbelebele of Peter, he says, I know who you are. He did not even let the others guess. He said, uh, you know, I know who you are. You are Christ. And he says, yes. And I tell, you, uh, I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell, hell shall not prevail against it. Now, we usually say, 
this rock that he's talking about, he's not, talking, he's not saying that uh, Peter is the rock. Rather, it is on this revelation, the church is founded on a simple principle. That Jesus came, he died. He resurrected. And he's seated on the right hand of God, the Father. That simple precept, that's where the church sits. Remove, remove Jesus dying, remove Jesus resurrecting, you have no Christianity. Praise the Lord. On this rock, on this fact, on this premise, on this principle, I shall build my church and the gates of heads shall not prevail again. In other words, it doesn't matter what the devil shall bring on our way. I have people I've raised up. People with that, you know, that Caleb mentality, con conquest mentality. They shall go out, extract people from the kingdom of darkness and bring them into the kingdom of light. So I tell you, Peter, you are the rock. And on this rock, I'll build my church. And the gates of heads shall not prevail again. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth, it shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Amen. Prophet Daniel says in Daniel chapter 11 and verses that, that the people that do know their God, meaning if you have an experience in the past about God, you can be able to look into the future. It says the people that know their God, they shall be strong. And they shall do exploits. That is a part B of that scripture. Caleb, as an individual, had many things to celebrate. He had outlived everyone. He was the oldest man there, except for Joshua. He was a custodian of the history of Jews. And I was saying, I know when they are, they are fighting, when they, when, they, uh, when they are fighting, they say, who shall go for first? And say, let Judah go first. Why Judah first is because they have somebody who, has the custodian, who is the custodian of the history of the Jews. He shall even help them on how to fight the enemy. This man, Caleb, he had received his portion of inheritance as originary promise. He believed that there was more mountains to possess, which he had worked, uh, worked on 45 years earlier on a spy mission. Caleb, because of this, received Hebron, which was the greatest of the prize. By the way, the whole land, Hebron was some of the richest and the most fertile of the lands. Those are the places where the grapes were the biggest. And this is what God gave him. Now, uh, Hebrews 10, 23 encourages us. It says, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope. Hallelujah. Do you have a hope? Do you have a promise that God gave you? I want to tell you, hold fast to that hope. Because he that promised is what? He is faithful. Our God who promised you that, that God who said that you shall get married, that God is not a lie. In fact, Numbers 23, 19, part B of it again, it says, has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? God spoke it. It shall surely come. Amen. So, what are the lessons that we draw from Caleb, Caleb's conquest mentality? I have four of them. We ran through them very quickly. We ran through four of the things, the lessons that we draw from that Caleb's conquest mentality. Number one, number one is that confidence for the future is founded on the testimonies of the past. Confidence of the future or for the future is founded or is to be founded on the testimonies of the past. It is very important for us to look behind and see what God has done. Let me tell you, even for you, for the last two years, when we have been running with this Advancing for Congress, you may have written a few things, but none of those things have come to pass. But does it mean that God is not faithful? No. You are alive. That is a testimony of his faithfulness. You are alive. Actually, you are healthy. You coughed once, but after taking ginger and uh, that mixer, eh? you know, that home I went and you have never remembered it. Praise the Lord. You may not know, but what was, was trying to come to, 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 to knock your life was something big, but it was completed by, it was uh, annihilated, it was finished by garlic and the other things that you put. You know them. Confidence for the future is founded on what? The testimonies 
of the past. Now, the book of Psalm chapter 136, I want you to go and read it. Because chapter 136 does nothing but reflect on what God has done for Israel. It tells them of their history, how God has nurtured them, has carried them in, their, in his wings, how God has fought battles for them. Now, in verses 10 and 11, the Bible, the Bible says, Psalm 136, and this is a song that, uh, uh, which the leader uh, sings, and then the congregation also responds. That one, Psalm 136, verse 10, verse 10 says, To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, for his steadfast love endures forever, and brought Israel out from among them, for his steadfast love endures forever. Now, this was very pertinent to the Israel. They, they were able to identify with it. They knew what happened in, in Egypt. I was saying in the first service that uh, Pharaoh is a stronghold. Tell somebody Pharaoh is a stronghold. If you want to know, please listen keenly to intercessors praying. You hear them binding the, the strong man, the Pharaoh. Pharaoh is a title of a king. It's something, it represents an order of oppression. 400 years, what history do you have? You have, you know, that's where you have been born, raised up. That's all that you know. That's what you began with. And that's what your great, 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 great grandfather also experienced. Who are you to change that order? Yet, in a period of a very short time, you know, some two men come there. Actually, one man called Moses. You know, he's a, some guy who has come from the desert. And he says he has a message from God. And he comes to Pharaoh. And for the next many seasons, miracles, extraordinary things are happening. So much so that in the last one, Pharaoh himself has to send an SMS. He had to send his chariots in the night to go look for Aaron and uh, Moses and tell them, please take everything that you have. Take all your cows, even the cows that are you know, unhealthy. Take them. Take all everything that you have, even rabbits and whatever else that you keep, even your dogs, go with them and worship your God because of the mighty hand of God. So when they are writing Psalm 136, it's something reminding them of what was there in the, in the past and therefore give them confidence. So the confidence for the future is to be founded on the testimonies of the past. My brother, my sister, you have a testimony. You have what God has done for you. It may not be what you have written down, but if you sit, you can find. I was also saying that uh, this is the reason why every organization, somewhere around now, they begin to do their accounts. Why do they do their accounts? They begin to tabulate. The departments come together. They, they evaluate this and that department. Why do they do that? They want to see the future. But you cannot see the future except you first of all reflect on the past. Praise the Lord. And no wonder around this time they come up with a strategy. Because there was a weak department. This is how we are going to counter it in the coming year. Confidence for the future is to be founded on the testimonies of the past. Ask somebody, do you have a testimony? Number two. Number two. Number two. Number two is that for God, time is inconsequential. And this is important. God, for God, where God is mentioned, where God is, where God is doing his thing, time is inconsequential. Amen. It's not a consideration. It's not something that God raises up. And, uh, you know, and I stuck, oh my goodness. God has to live in a mambo. Second Peter, chapter 3 and verses 8. The Bible says, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years. And a thousand years is one. So if you come and tell God that uh, he has fast tracked it, that's what, uh, what he does. If you come and tell God he has delayed it, that is his nature. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any of you should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That is very important. Then Habakkuk also cements this in Habakkuk 2.2. says, and the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain, uh, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. 
For still the vision awaits an appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. I want to tell you the vision you had. Please do not let it die. I want to tell you that even now, God can do it. You know, there are things, uh, especially when you're younger, uh, we, there are those things that we think we, we shall do at 25 or at 35 or at 40. Now you're not 40. You are not even 45. You are not even 55. You are somewhere there. I want to tell you, that can be accomplished in one day. You, you know, the one thing I appreciated, uh, Caleb talking to, to Joshua, he says, I'm today 85 years old. But as I'm as young as I was 45 years ago. And I was telling the first service that, uh, you know, when they were in, in the wilderness, the clothes they wore never got on. And the shoes they wore never got old. Those are shoes and those are clothes. What about the man himself? Hallelujah. Those that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength, mounting up with wings as eagles, running, not growing weary. And while they walk, they shall not be faint. Hallelujah. Let me tell you, when this man is saying, I'm as young, he is not, he's not joking. He is saying the facts are there. What he could do at 40, he was doing at 85. We declare in the name of Jesus that uh, your life now, Yeah, it is 16 plus few years. Praise the Lord. And you can do the things that you desire to do. Even for Abraham, they were renewed at a hundred, you know, and uh, they were renewed and they came back. Faithfulness breeds, you know, renewal of spirit and mind. Hallelujah. Time is inconsequential. Is it that a prophecy was given to you? A word was given to you? you God revealed it to you something? I want to tell you there is time to have this accomplished. Have the conquest mentality. Number three. Number three, and this is also good. Are you enjoying the sermon? <laughs> Number three, ask, see, seek, and pursue your Hebron. Ask, seek, and pursue your. It is your right. Your Hebron is your. You know what was promised, eh? Is yours, and it cannot be changed. Now, Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 says, Ask, and it will be given to you. This is Jesus speaking. It is marked red in my Bible. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened for them. But I was a few In this office, you know, somebody said in, in, in one of the offices, you know, you, you, uh, you so and so, uh, I want you by next year, I want you to be heading this department or to be taking the, this role and responsibility. Let me tell you, brethren, and I quote my, my DGO. My DGO says that he believes in prayer and he prays a lot, but he also sp believes in speaking with people. Praise the Lord. It is not a crime for you to go to your boss and go and tell them, uh, you remember, sir, of course, you must be working. You must have proven yourself in work. Uh, you said, I'm a, this was mentioned a year ago, six months ago, that this would happen. Uh, is the opportunity still there? And you don't go when you see that the opportunity is there. You, sometimes you go even when the opportunity is not there. Because God can orchestrate. They can say, they can say no in the morning, only to realize in the evening that actually that opportunity was there. Praise the Lord. So it's not enough. It says, ask. And let me tell you, this is what this man did. Whose responsibility was it to remember what Moses spoke? Was it Joshua's or was it Caleb's? It was Caleb's. Praise the Lord. But weren't they together in the same boardroom when these things were being spoken? They were together. But Caleb said, well, walked to his compatriot, his friend, and said, remember the words. And, you know, Joshua's mind was refreshed. 
And he remembered the words of Moses. And what did he do? Exactly what Moses had said. He was given Hebron as an extra to what was rightly his. Ask. Praise the Lord. Ask. In your workplace, in your business, ask. And sometimes seek. Look for it. And you're going to find it. The last one that I have in this order is uh, number four. Is that God who promises is faithful. And his gifts are irrevocable. Amen. God who promises is? All these promises. We are not talking about the promises of the, of the, uh, of the coalition of government that rules. And it's not even Democrats or Republicans. We are talking about the promises of God. And what have we said? They are irrevocable. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23. The Bible says, let us hold fast. Hold fast ni kushikilia kwa ungumu. Without letting loose. Hold fast the confession of your hope. It's not even the confession of your faith. The confession of your hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Has God said something? Please hold to that hope that he that promised, because he's faithful, he will see it done in your life. Hallelujah. Now, a memory verse. This is a memory verse. You must uh, memorize this. Romans 11 verse 29. And about God, the Bible says here, for the gifts and the calling of God are irre. <laughs> you know, do you know when God speaks, that cannot be canceled out. It cannot be reversed. What he said about you, you may even have backslidden. Like in juzi, to mekuombea, ama umeombewa, ama umejiombea, na umerudi. I want to tell you, what he said then, it is still holds. The promise he gave you when you first got born again, when you are walking, before you backslid. I want to tell you that our God is faithful. His promises, they are irrevocable. You, can, you are the only ones who can say, no, no, I don't want it fulfilled in my life. But as long as you pursue it, as long as you have that uh, conquest mentality, you can achieve it. Hallelujah. So what's the conclusion? The conclusion is, do not be satisfied with your current achievements. What you have achieved, the success that you have had, please let us send another success card of the future happenings. Hallelujah. Trust God for more as long as you are alive. It could be salvation of the loved one. could be an altar ship that you shall help build, uh, maybe in a locality up country. It could be an empowering minister. Some of you are endowed with graces to empower ministers. It could be financing the gospel. Have a conquest mentality and pursue the hill country of Hebron. There is Hebron to, to get. Support the, this ministry. Support the GCI vision. For God renews those that trust in him. Even in their old age, they are able to function as the youth. God bless you. Let's be upstanding. Amen. Conquest mentality. I want to tell you, brethren, there is much to gain and to get. Do not be satisfied. Do not just be born again. And therefore, there are those among us, you know, time has quickly passed and you do not seem to have achieved what you thought you would. God, as we have said, God redeems time. Time is not a factor or a limitation where he is involved. What, he has, not, uh, what has not been done for you over 30, 20, 10, 5 or less years, God has the capacity to help you achieve it now. And you never know, as you have said, maybe God is preparing you to be the church financier. So as Joshua said, uh, chapter 14, verse 12, so now give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. Hallelujah. I know while I, I was speaking, you have remembered a few things that God has, has talked to you. Some of them is while you are in a congregation like this, and as that word came, you realize that this is basically what God would desire and intend me to do. Now there are five, these are five years, ten years, or more, many more years, or a few years, and you have not achieved. I want us to ask God to give us that grace of conquest mentality. Amen. You can take a minute, or to just take a minute and speak to God and ask him to help you to achieve those things that are look far behind. 
but help you to achieve them now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you, real God, this morning. We give you praise. We give you glory. Every one of us speaking to God. Lord, I want to pray in the name of Jesus that you shall help me, real God. On these prophecies that were spoken to me during a crusade, during a visitation, by my elder brother, by my younger sister, Lord, spoken to me by my dad and my mom, spoken to me by my pastor in the former church that I was in, spoken to me during a prayer meeting by brethren. Lord, this word that was spoken, oh God, it seemed very far. It it has not happened in the years I thought it would. Lord, I pray like Caleb, Father, give me this mountain, give me this Hebron, that Father, I shall accomplish the purposes for which you send me. And you call me, O oh God. Thank you, Father. That even though I backslid or I went back and have come back, I pray that what you said about me being an evangelist, being a pastor, being a minister, you shall accomplish it in this season, even in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And if you're one of them uh, that desire God to give you that grace of conquer, uh, you know, uh, conquest mentality, just lift up your hand and pray with us. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you for the hands lifted up. I want to thank you, Father, for the miracle that is happening right now. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray for a release of grace, a release of God of tenacity, of resilience, of grace, oh God, to accomplish in the mighty name of Jesus. We have been around here, Kadesh Benair, going around, but now we arise like Caleb. Give us our mountain. Give us according to the promise. I pray in the name of Jesus that we shall send them angels their way, but also the Holy Spirit, the counsel, the guide, Lord, the one that gives them direction in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that this shall become Lord, those that advance this kingdom, that Father God conquer for this kingdom in the name of Jesus Christ. You say that you are instituting the church. You are founding the church and the gates of hate shall not prevail against them. I pray that this shall be them, firebrights and Lord anointed to do your will and purpose. Hallelujah.